Thank you so much, Professor Weishi and Monsieur Alexandre Georgini, uh, Le Consul de France, for your kind remarks. I feel a bit conflicted because I'm both French and HKUST. So I'm very proud of what HKUST is doing in sustainability. Although I'm also proud that France is doing so much in terms of education in sustainability. And I'm sure that uh, with our new programs and our new campus in Guangzhou that Professor Xi has been spending so much time and energy in developing that we will see a lot of new initiatives on our front and hopefully some of those will be partnerships with uh, our French companies and our French education partners. With this, welcome to the first panel. The first panel has to do with green and sustainable finance and I'm delighted to welcome our prestigious panelists. So let me introduce them very, very briefly, one by one. I will start with Ms. Anne-Catherine Husson-Traoré. She is the CEO of Novetic, which is a very interesting company that was set up by Caisse des Depots under Ms. Husson-Traoré's leadership um, as a uh, education uh, media platform and also uh, very importantly an auditor for the green fin label in France and Miss uh, Usson Traoré is also uh, part of the EU high level expert group on sustainable finance which she joined in 2017. Welcome Anne Catherine. Uh, we also have Victoria Land, she's the head of sustainable banking at Asia Pacific for a financial institution I'm very fond of because that's where I started my banking career, Crédit Agricole CNIB. And uh, she joined this team in 2019 to focus on green, sustainable and social impact transactions before which she was at HSBC. So she has considerable experience in sustainable and green finance. Welcome, Victoria. Then we have Professor Gianfranco Gianfrante, who is Professor of Finance at EDEC Business School. Uh, and uh, he also has been uh, holding various teaching positions in a number of uh, prestigious education, uh, higher education uh, institutions. And last but not least, my very own colleague, Professor Robert Gibson, who is adjunct professor in the division of uh, environment and sustainability at HKUST. He's also a fellow of the Civic Exchange, which is an institution that's been set up a number of years ago to promote uh, environmental uh, goals and uh, climate change transition. Uh, before uh, joining us, he was um, the director of sustainable development for a very large Hong Kong based group, Chan Swire and Sons from 2007 to 2010. Welcome, Robert. So we're going to start this hour and a bit together by having each of my prestigious panelists in turn first share a few thoughts about the topic of green and sustainable finance. And I will first ask Miss Husson Traoré to uh, share her thoughts and insights with us. You're muted. We cannot. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, thanks a lot for this invitation. I'm very pleased to share with you uh, all the things about um, sustainable finance, Novetic, and more precisely, European sustainable finance. Uh, maybe uh, just to uh, put the the data, uh, the, the calendar in place. Um, this is really the journey between 2015 and 2021. Uh, 2015, as you know, was the year of uh, Paris Agreement for climate change, but it was also the year where, when United Nations adopted Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, uh, which are more globally about sustainability. And why are they the biggest game changer for for the world, but also for finance, because uh, they put in place two targets. 
One target is the, to limit climate change at two degrees at the end of the century, which means net zero at the middle of the century. But maybe we have to keep in mind that with SDGs, we have 17 priorities which, has, which are linked for this decade, and there are 169 targets for 2030. Uh, both suggest a big shift in economy and finance because the idea is we are not aligned with Paris Agreement, you know that, but with also with SGs. So if we want to try after the pandemic and the Council said that we, uh, it's the strongest way to recover uh, and it's the strongest way to uh, be resilient because we need to do so. Uh, COVID-19 could be the, the, first, um, the first pandemic, but surely not the, the last one. My point is to say that where do we come from? We come from responsible investment to uh, sustainable finance. Responsible investment was a growing practice since 20 years in Europe. Uh, it drives investors to select or to exclude listed companies on ESG criteria, E for environmental, S for uh, social, and G for governance. Uh, these criteria are like human rights, green, or governance issue. Uh, ESG ratings used by responsible investors are based on backward-looking ESG data provided by companies with a lack of quality and liability. That's one of the main points, because this data were not able to um, were not able to help investors and more broadly uh, companies and states to meet the Paris Agreement targets because they are not forward-looking data, and uh, that's the main point where um, start. Uh, where starts the EU in 2015 when they launched this high-level expert group. That means that we have to design a new, um, a new framework for finance and the idea, and that was called sustainable finance. Sustainable finance not really replace responsible investment, but it's a new way because it's a large way for finance to move from uh, the, the finance, as you know, business as usual family, finance to a finance that tries to help to meet uh, SDGs. Um, this journey became uh, became in uh, 2015, and uh, but the main point is 2018 because after one year of work, the HLEG published a report. Uh, this report is still available, and uh, if you have the opportunity, I send it to you, the, the, the link uh, for that, because this report designs what is really sustainable finance uh, for, uh, how does it, uh, sorry for my English, it's very early in France, so uh, it's more difficult for me, but uh, I try to do my best. So if I come to the report, the idea is to design what could be sustainable finance for Europe and more broadly for the for all um, investors who want to use this concept. The idea is we need to address every part of the finance industry, which means not only ESG data or, um, or ESG practices of companies and investors, but also benchmarks, but also all the practices, the idea is to shift the trillions you can find in the finance industry to um, that finance could help over industries, over sectors to meet Paris Agreement, but also SDGs. The three pillars of this plan is taxonomy, disclosures, and disclosure and benchmarks. Taxonomy, maybe you heard about that, is the idea of green, to qualify green assets how to qualify them first to have the, the, the first target is to have a common uh, language about what is green or not but the green activities are the one who help to make the green objectives of europe and that's maybe the main point of sustainable finance the idea is not to uh, have financial practices to uh, make money with money and always more money with money the idea is this money needs to serve to serve 
the uh, objectives of EU or uh, I, uh, Hong Kong or other, other countries. That's the main shift. Uh, why disclosure? Disclosure March 2021 uh, is the one um, is the month where the very new disclosure, very new regulation uh, comes into force. This is called Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation (SFDR), and that's really a big shift because uh, SFDR is the idea of um, of that well, it's the framework for investors to disclose how they take sustainability risks and adverse impacts into account in their investment decisions. They have to explain very clear, they have to do so, and they have to explain very clearly to all kinds of customers, even the, the, the savers, the, the people. And the last but not least, uh, the benchmarks, that's a very strong point because benchmarks are used to measure uh, financial performances first, but they are also um, a very strong tool uh, to um, reorient or to make this shift with uh, all the uh, passive industry, financial industry. And EU launched two new benchmarks. One is uh, called Paris Line Benchmark, PAB, and the overall climate transition uh, benchmark, which means um, Paris Line is uh, the, strong, the, the strongest on climate change issue, and the other one is uh, related to, um, to the transition. Because as far as you know, we identify the brown industry with fossil fuel, which is really carbon intensive. We know what is green, but the question is what we do with all the rest of the companies, what we could call that gray. Um, so this part, well, this huge part of economy has to move and has to make a transition. So benchmarks on other tools launched by EU right now and for the next uh, two years are the very useful to make this transition very concrete. And maybe one of the first um, very interesting thing is they start with finance. Uh, just to have to keep in mind three things very important with the taxonomy EU define um, EU define two enfin, three uh, very strong principles first to be green and to be uh, uh, taxonomy comp taxo compliant an activity need to give a substantial contribution to the environmental objectives but in the same time this activity has do no. Uh, um, uh, with this activity do no uh, has to have no significant harm on an overall environmental in um, in uh, objective. And last but not least, they have to comply with minimum safeguards. What are these safeguards? It could be SDGs, it could be uh, business and human rights, uh, UN principles, it could be a global compact. So the idea is really, okay, you are in the green field, but you need to comply with other standards on social and governance issues. That's why all sustainable finance is, uh, the, the purpose of all sustainable finance is to provide, um, is to provide a really a different way and to embrace all the ESG aspects, all the 17 priorities of SDGs. Uh, just maybe to, to end my, uh, First, uh, first intervention. Um, it's very important why sustainable finance is growing so fast. First, because there is a strong pressure. The strong pressure comes from many parts, from the EU Commission on uh, DG uh, financial markets, but also from NGOs. In Europe, NGOs are very pushy on finance. Uh, on finance. Uh, we have, for example, an NGO called Reclaim Finance, uh, which is uh, led by Lucie Pinson, who was a Golden uh, Prize of Environment this year. And this, uh, this is an NGO entirely dedicated to finance, and they have strong program about uh, exit call, and they define uh, what at what conditions 
an exit from coal could be good, which means good for climate change, because we have now a big, we have really big risks of greenwashing about uh, exclusion, uh, which means, okay, we sell our coal uh, shares, but at the end of the day, somebody else uh, is uh, buying them. So it has no real impact on climate change. So that's why uh, during these last five years, many, um, many uh, pressures were, were settled or banks met a lot of pressures. We can give just a very concrete example with HSBC, uh, which was uh, on the fray uh, of a resolution for this is for its AGM about coal, about his coal policy. So they uh, announced a few days ago that they uh, have a strong commitment on coal. It means they uh, phase out financing thermal, thermal coal mining and coal power by 2030 in the EU and OECD and by 2040 worldwide. Uh, HSBC is, if I'm right, based in Hong Kong. So uh, that was really a strong movement because we know that coal is growing, is decreasing in Europe, in, sometimes in OECD countries, but the question is for climate change more globally. So to conclude, how you could imagine, um, you could imagine with all of that, how sustainable finance disrupts uh, traditional finance traditional financial practices. That's why many banks, asset managers, asset owners, PRI signatories need new skills. So every student or professionals who could have these new skills could find a job of a promotion very easily. Uh, in the case in Europe, especially in France, but Germany, for example, is also moving to be a leader on sustainable finance. United Kingdom has the same ambition on a worldwide perspective. So sustainable finance is not already the new normal, but it will be soon. And uh, that's why, for example, I'm one of the teacher of uh, the first master of uh, sust on sustainable finance uh, delivered by a Kedge Business School in, in France. So I try to mix a, a lot of concepts, but I hope that uh, uh, you have a clear vision about uh, what is sustainable finance, where does it come from, and what are the huge targets of uh, this ambitious program launched by EU, but in partnership with other parts of the world. So that's why there is a sustainable international platform launched by the EU, uh, where other countries are discussing about many issues, like taxonomy, there is a partnership with EU and China about taxonomy. Okay, thank you very much, Ad and Catherine, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, let me now pass on uh, the time uh, and the screen to uh, our friends at Credit Agricole CIB. Victoria, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, um, indeed. Thank you for, for having um, me to present um, today. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, indeed, and as part of the work that I would like to cover in this session, um, I wanted to let you know about the sustainable finance market, um, specifically from a, a banking perspective. And as uh, Anne Catherine was just very expertly explaining, the role of sustainable finance has very dramatically and positively disrupted the capital market landscape. And because of this positive disruption, we have seen the sustainable finance um, segment of uh, the capital markets grow at one of the fastest rates um, we have seen in the capital markets to date. So it's a very exciting development to see that in today's market, depending on how you measure it, but about 8% um, to 10% of um, global debt volumes are now raised in sustainable format, um, which Victoria, coming... Are you sharing your slides or do you want to, us to put them up? Um, if you could put them up, please, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yes, yeah, so coming to how that might be relevant to any of our um, participants in today's WebEx, uh, as you can see, the, the market volumes have grown so much there indeed will be many um, sustainable finance opportunities, and I'll come on to those in a little bit. 
But um, just in terms of the, the market volumes, we've seen, as I said, about 8%, so around $750 billion um, dollars across the bond and the loan market are now issued in either green or sustainably linked format. And the distinction between those two products are um, quite defined use of proceeds. If you've got an identifiable green project, so a wind farm or a green building, it can be financed by a green loan or a green bond. If you don't have an identifiable use of proceeds, but instead you want to show the capital market space, so banks and investors, how you are supporting sustainable development, you can instead look at disclosing KPIs, so key performance indicators in the sustainable space and use a sustainability linked mechanism. And so part of the work that we do at Credit Agricole and the team that I run um, looks at on a daily basis is structuring those transactions for our clients. But coming to the topic of, um, of my area in terms of is global regulation for sustainable finance possible? And indeed, is it a good thing? Um, I think the, the debate is still very much um, at play. And as Anne-Catherine was just mentioning there, the fantastic work on the EU taxonomy um, really has been uh, one of the first uh, collective effort, efforts from many countries to come up with uh, a taxonomy for sustainable finance. And so that means looking at the types of sectors that can be classified as green, and also within those sectors, if there are any thresholds or specific criteria considerations to be met, to ensure that the quality of that green project or green asset is universal. And so um, we have seen on March the 10th, um, the French finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, has proposed a common EU-US taxonomy um, during the meeting with the US climate change envoy, John Kerry. And so that is, again, a step forward from the EU taxonomy to broadening scope um, outside of the EU, essentially. Um, what I think is very clear from the EU tax on new success is it will become a benchmark for future regulation. Um, and it already has done to some extent. You know, I sit in, in Hong Kong, obviously, but I'm responsible for Asia Pacific, um, and that includes from Australia through Asia and to the Middle East. Um, and in that, we see a number of clients looking at the EU taxonomy, even though they are very Asia Pacific focused, both in terms of their operations and also in terms of the banks that they are speaking to and the investors that they are trying to attract. So global sustainable finance regulation might be the next step, but obviously to do that, we do have to be quite cognizant of the local legislation and the country specific energy transition pathways. And there is a lot of research done by the International Energy Agency and the Transition Pathway Initiative, just to mention two, um, which if any of you are interested after this session, um, please do go and look into and, and obviously feel free to reach out to me to discuss further. But these are two types of um, initiatives whereby it's very clear that country specific um, energy transition pathways do need to be taken into account um, because every country has an ability to move at a different pace and every country has different considerations or different hurdles to overcome. So taking a, a sort of a step lower than that in terms of um, the ESG standards and maybe the guidance that has been developed for issuers and particularly relevant to the markets that I work in and how that sits under, I guess, the idea of global regulation. Um, it's really the International Capital Markets Association, ICMA, and the Loan Market Association, the LMA, who have um, essentially now created and run the market guidance. So you might have heard of the green bond principles um, the social bond principles and the sustainability bond guidelines. They're actually documents that Credit Agricole is very proud to have co-authored. And indeed, we sit on the executive committee within ICMA 
for these documents. So we help with their annual updates and running. And the same too from the green loan principles. And in short time, um, you will see the social loan principles um, also be published. So I think these are the documents whereby if any of you were looking at wanting careers in sustainable finance, either in a banking context or indeed in any sustainable finance avenue, whether that be looking at um, becoming a, a member of a treasury team in a corporation or within one of the large accounting um, firms looking at sustainable finance. These are fundamental documents to this market. And, and I would suggest that you go and take a look at them and become familiar with them because the disclosures that they recommend are essentially the parameters within which I at least start my basis guidance and then from there work with each individual client, uh, client scenario to help structure transactions. Um, on this page, you can see I also mentioned the transition um, bond principles are not in the market, but there is a document called the Climate Transition Finance Handbook, which is also run by ICMA, so you'll find it on the ICMA website. Um, and the other um, initiative to, to take a, a, a bit of time looking into is the Climate Bond Initiative. And they are actually, um, they were before the EU taxonomy. Um, they have been developing sector specific taxonomies and guidance to try to define those thresholds for what is classified as green um, in the market. So then if we just um, switch to the next uh, two pages, I just wanted to highlight um, China and Hong Kong's commitment to climate change because obviously um, very relevant to us, um, but also maybe indeed if you're looking at staying in um, Hong Kong or China, very relevant to the future careers that um, you could consider. And indeed, both China and Hong Kong have um, signed the uh, Paris Climate Agreement and indeed have made um, commitments to climate change and also specifically um, carbon neutrality pledges. So China um, in their um, Climate Ambition Summit of last year, the 2020 um, summit, um, made uh, a declaration of 2060 carbon neutrality. And in Hong Kong's uh, climate policy address delivered at the end of 2020, um, gave a 2050 carbon neutrality pledge. And so what those can mean for us specifically sitting here in, in Hong Kong and, and indeed uh, in China is that there will be um, many, sorry, there will be um, many opportunities, I'm sure, um, across a lot of the corporations, the financial service providers, and indeed the financial institutions like banks to help look at how we make investments that will essentially deliver upon these targets. So looking at investing into renewable energies or smart urban transportation or energy efficiency projects or water um, resource projects. And so there will be um, across corporations, financial institutions, and indeed um, the financial capital markets I think uh, a wealth of investment opportunities to assess. And indeed, if you wanted to mix um, a sustainable agenda with the, the finance agenda, I'm sure uh, a lot of positions um, open for you in, in the future. I might just pause there and, and hand back to Professor Veronique. Thank you so much, Victoria. That was uh, very uh, interesting to see the development uh, from your perspective. Um, sorry, did I cut you? Okay. Um, and then I will pass now the time to Professor Gianfrate. Uh, Gianfranco, do you want to share your own slide or do you need us to share it for you? Uh, I would be grateful if you could share my slides. So we should share your slides. Yes. yes okay, please. that is so good. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. So my, yes. colleagues, my colleagues will share your slides shortly. Yes. So in order to sort of uh, start the discussion um, this morning, I was uh, um, thinking of uh, sharing with you is uh, a couple of, uh, of uh, 
uh, of, of slides of pictures that are, uh, I think, interesting to understand how academia and the research is uh, tackling the uh, climate change challenges and opportunities from a financial point of view. So what you see in, uh, in uh, this slide is basically a, basically a, a very simple exercise. So uh, scholars have tried to understand what is the carbon footprint of uh, small items or small activities that we, we carry out uh, every day. So what you see is uh, that the big circle at the center is the carbon footprint of a small burger. So this comes mostly from uh, the meat and uh, um, the, the production of meat that uh, uh, has a very important carbon uh, footprint. But then uh, you see also that uh, some trivial activities we uh, carry out on a daily basis, like sending an email uh, as a carbon footprint. And depending on the, on the length of the email, the carbon footprint can, uh, can change significantly. So this is uh, um, also our, our Zoom call right now as a carbon footprint that is uh, not that trivial. Uh, so uh, on, on the one end, this is a sort of a, um, a, a suggestion to, to write shorter uh, emails and avoid uh, uh, unnecessary attachment in the emails. But what is interesting is that now we start to have uh, data that are very, very precise about what is the carbon footprint of business activities. And in a situation where uh, the uh, major economies are moving towards uh, uh, carbon price mechanisms, so there is already one in place in Europe, uh, China is working on it, and now also with uh, the new administration in the United States, it's very likely that there is going to be a, a carbon pricing system in uh, the US as well. So now, it, the banking system, the financial system, the investors are starting to think at what is the carbon footprint of companies they are invested in. And because that carbon footprint is going to become a financial cost and for some companies it's going to become a very important financial cost. So the cash flows of the companies are going to be hit in a very profound way by the uh, taxation of, uh, of uh, carbon emissions. So this is a, a very interesting uh, sort of a challenge and opportunity for, uh, uh, for us, for, for scholars, but also for students, because uh, uh, it's not trivial to measure uh, the carbon footprint and the financial consequences of having a higher or lower carbon footprint. Uh, I will uh, ask to, to move to the to the next uh, slide, if possible. So uh, here um, you have something uh, different. So what, when we speak of climate uh, risk from a financial point of view, there are two kinds of risks. One is that so-called transition risk, that the, and these, uh, for example, the, uh, the carbon pricing risk that that we uh, that we saw in the previous slide. The other one, the most probably obvious and the closest to our uh, um, everyday experience, is uh, what we call a climate physical risk, and these. Uh, uh, all uh, it, it pertains all the risks related to the, the change in uh, uh, global warming in uh, in the atmosphere, the intensification of storms, hurricanes. So in the top graph, you see uh, um, a map that shows the heat waves, so the intensity of the heat waves across the world. I'm sure you have you've already seen a, gra a graph like this, or probably a video where, where you can see that. Uh, on the basis of the data we have, the, uh, there is a clear intensification of these uh, natural adverse uh, phenomenon that are due to climate change. So the, the, the red area, so the, that, you know, uh, that is about the tropics that are mostly affected by heat waves is going to, uh, to, to become larger over time. We can, we can already see that this is happening. Now, the interesting fact about this, this graph uh, is uh, uh, who is the author of this graph? The author of this graph is, is, is not a, um, a sort of a, a natural scientist, is actually Standard & Poor's. So uh, one of the leading rating agencies in the world. 
what is uh, Standard & Poor's doing with, uh, with this kind of graph? Well, you can see in the table below the graph what they are doing. Basically, uh, Standard & Poor's is now analyzing for uh, uh, each company uh, they cover, so companies that uh, issue uh, uh, bonds, corporate bonds, uh, um, Standard & Poor's is analyzing uh, where uh, each plant the company operates directly or uh, the company has in its supply chain is located and is creating maps to understand what is the uh, physical risk each plant is uh, um, exposed to. So in terms of uh, flood risk, uh, heat waves, cold waves, hurricane, and so on. And they are scoring uh, what is the exposure of each plant uh, to these uh, physical climate risks. Uh, the consequence is that the ratings that uh, Standard & Poor's uh, uh, is going to, to, to issue in the future are going to integrate in a very precise, in a very granular way, what is the exposure of uh, companies to climate physical risk. So this uh, is, is interesting on, uh, on, uh, on two levels, I would say. First of all, uh, in order to understand uh, climate risk from a financial point of view, you need to uh, sort of be proficient with uh, a little bit of natural sciences and a little bit of engineering, because uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, we are at a stage where it is no longer uh, enough to say uh, we care about climate. You need to have uh, metrics, you need to have uh, uh, numbers in order to quantify the, uh, the risks and the opportunities of climate change. The second uh, reason that, uh, for which I think this is a sort of very interesting, very important message is that uh, the integration of uh, climate risks in uh, uh, financial markets, activities and consideration is happening already, is happening right now. So this is no longer something that, uh, that you know, is, uh, you can think of uh, something, some a future scenario. It's something that is uh, uh, happening right now and that there is a huge need for, uh, for new professionals that are really able to navigate this kind of metrics and they also have uh, the ingenuity to, to create uh, new uh, investment strategies new uh, you know, financial products that incorporate climate change considerations. And I will uh, uh, pass uh, to uh, next speaker. Thank you very much. Sorry, I put the wrong button. Thank you so much, Joan Franco, for sharing this. This was very, very striking and uh, insightful. And I think it's a great transition to my colleague, uh, Professor Robert Gibson, uh, who has uh, some really interesting perspective as well. Robert, you're on. You need to unmute yourself. You're muted. You're still muted. You need to, are there you? Thank you very much. I have managed at last to find the button. Uh, I apologize for the delay. So um, I've titled this Sustainable fin Finance Responding to an Enduring Emergency. Uh, and um, you know, I've been focused on this area of, you know, how do we respond to climate change? Not for as long as some people, but certainly for over 15 years. And the feeling is that during most of those 15 years, um, we haven't moved the needle. We haven't done a great deal. Yes, the Paris Agreement was an excellent step in the right direction, but it was a de declaration of intent as much as actually doing something. Uh, now, I think that we are going to start to see uh, dramatic acceleration in the uh, global response to climate change, to this enduring emergency which climate presents. So why now? Well, firstly, the issue is better understood now than it has been in the past. Uh, uh, we can point to a lot more evidence of climate impacts, which people that can see it and understand it. And the, the science from the IPCC is clearer. 
Secondly, the concept of net zero, the net zero imperative is much more widely understood. We are adding fuel to the flames every year that we have net emissions. Until we get to zero carbon emissions for humanity as a whole, we are continuing to make climate change worse. So net zero is not a sort of, can we do a cost benefit analysis? Is it worthwhile? It is an imperative. And in fact, probably we're going to overshoot and we're going to have to be sucking carbon out of the atmosphere in the second half of the century. The third thing is that the current COVID pandemic, I think is a game changer. We've been told forever that another Spanish flu will happen sooner or later, but it's always been tomorrow's problem, which we don't need to think about. Well, tomorrow's problem last year became today's threat and um, has dramatically altered the global economy and been what and the attention governments have paid. So will the same happen to climate change, which has always been a tomorrow's threat, but now really is seen as today's problem. And the COVID pandemic has given governments around the world current experience in taking exceptional action. It's almost, you know, they've had experience of getting onto a wartime footing, doing things which they would not normally do. So I do think that changes it. So what is going to happen? Well, I think that Europe's growing deal is very much leading the way. Um, the EU by its nature um, has mechanisms to get different countries to agree things. And the whole climate change problem, it needs many countries to agree. So if Europe's gonna agree amongst itself, then it's a start for getting the world to agree. Secondly, the IFRS foundation, which sets the single global accounting standards has now said that it is going to set up a sustainability standards board to get rid of the alphabet soup where we have many competing and confusing uh, ways of reporting on sustainability and having one good one. Thirdly, the UN action continues and we're now approaching the sort of, well, it's, it, we're now past it, but the, at the Paris Agreement had a five-year ratchet mechanism. Should have happened last year but because of the Paris Agreement, it's happening this year and it will I think, up the action. Within Hong Kong, our um, Securities and Futures Commission and Hong Kong Monetary Authority have formed a steering group and it is work and working on the common ground taxonomy, which was mentioned by earlier speakers. So to go into the details, or a little bit of the, quickly into the details of what's going to make the, what's the action that's going to drive it? Well, firstly, within Europe. So Europe has um, committed to a, aggressive 55% reduction in emissions from 1990 by 2030 and net zero in 2050. They, in 2018, reformed their carbon pricing, their emissions trading scheme, and the price went has gone up from about $5 early 2018 to 40 with forecasts of 89 by the end of 2030. And that's getting to a level where it really does impact business decisions. And associated with that, they are discussing introducing a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Because what happened when they first started the EU ATS and had a reasonable price at the start, uh, they found that cement uh, manufacturers in Eastern Europe who were not paying the carbon price shipped cement by rail into the EU and undermined the whole mechanism. So this time around, they are talking about a border adjustment so that if something is manufactured, in a jurisdiction with a low carbon price and comes into Europe, some adjustment is paid on the way. And that can have a powerful effect. If you're a country and you're deciding whether to put a carbon price on, if you put the carbon price on, you get the money from um, issuing the carbon credit. If you don't put it on, then the EU collects it and keeps it at their border. So it will have a club effect and I think it will lead to um, a more general adoption of a carbon price, which is the probably number one thing in terms of driving the green economy. And then the mandatory disclosure. So um, the European Non-Financial Reporting Directive is um, leading the way, as with the item already mentioned about the sustainable financial disclosure requirement, getting um, funds um, eco-labeled so that when you are purchasing your emissions trade, your ETC, you know whether it, how green it is, how sustainable it is. So that is all um, significant action. And um, partly because of that action and uh, people in the rest of the world thinking, do we want to have 
um, just a European system or should we have a global system? The IFRS Foundation, which sets the accounting standards, has uh, decided to set up a sustainability standards board with the same governance as the uh, accounting one, which uh, works well with a mission to provide standards for reporting enterprise value, which includes value creation for society and the environment, with the key audience being the investors and lenders and creditors, the people who make capital allocation decisions. And the impact is not just on the people who are deciding which company to invest in, but it's on the impact on the companies. If you want to be able to raise money, you need to pay attention to this. And they have decided to prioritize, prioritize climate change as being you know, the key issue, but they will be covering other sustainability issues once they have climate change buttoned down. And they're going to build on the existing standards on the Task Force or Climate Related Financial Disclosures, GRI and SASB. So I think that is all moving in the right direction. It's received strong support from IOSCO, which is the um, International um, Association of Stock Exchanges and Regulators. So it really has the wind in its sails there, I think. And for, on the global governance, we have Mark Carney, who um, has many years experience at um, sort of G20 type level. He was governor of the Bank of Canada, governor of the Bank of England. He was, the he was one of the chairs of, for some years of the Financial Stability Board. And he is now special envoy for the United Nations Secretary General on Climate Action and Finance. And what he is working to try and achieve, I believe, is for large companies to, uh, for large company reporting to develop and disclose how they're going to move to net zero. And the target, I believe, is for the G20 meeting, which will happen in Italy, in, in Rome, in October, to agree that TCFD should be made mandatory in the near future. The UK is already committed to 2025 in Hong Kong. Um, our regulators have said that that's what they think should happen here. Banks and insurers uh, must manage risk. So they need to um, understand the carbon emissions they fund and have strategies for managing them down and disclose plans to align to net zero. And there's a group of central bankers covering, where 77 central bankers covering 75% of global emissions who are working to get that to happen through the regulations on banks. And, you know, investors need to report. So it's not just companies reporting, it's investors reporting about um, how, um, you know, what is the, a carbon footprint of their portfolios. And all of this requires credible, predictable public policies. So the taxes of the carbon price, people, if, if countries are, not countries, if companies uh, are sure that these policies are going to continue, then they will take action to accommodate them. And um, if you want to, uh, Mark Carney, gave a series of lectures uh, in December, where he runs through a lot of this and explains it, I think, quite well. So finally, just to talk about the Hong Kong bit. So we have our monetary authority and our stock exchange setting up this cross-agency group with five actions, making TCFD mandatory in relevant sectors by 2025, adopting the common ground taxonomy, which the EU and China are developing, and um, they've got a seat at the table in terms of the discussion on how to develop that, on supporting the sustainability standards boards establishing, being established by IFRS Foundation, in promoting climate-focused scenario analysis, and building capacity. Thank you very much. I don't know. This is Okay, thank you so much, uh, Robert. My uh, my system is slowing down at the moment, which is terribly annoying. Uh, that was a fantastic review of hugely important topics uh, in uh, Europe, uh, Hong Kong, and uh, China. Thank you so much. We already have a couple of questions that have been put into the Q&A box. And I think I'm going to start, we don't unfortunately have an awful lot of time left. 
Uh, so I'm going to first start by uh, asking the question that was in a Q&A box from one of my students, as it turned out. Uh, so Bianca is asking uh, specifically from uh, uh, Victoria uh, and Credit Agricole. Uh, I hope you're still there. Um, how, how has risk management and the relative department in a bank like Credit Agricole adapted to these new policies and objectives? Virginia, you still here? Do we still have anybody from Credit Agricole or did I lose them completely? Okay, I think we lost them. Oh dear. Okay, well then let me move to another question. This one is from Ivan. And I think this one would be more for Professor John Friday and Professor Gibson. What's the carbon price level you think will be if Hong Kong run its own emission trading scheme? So uh, if the starting point as a reference is the European market, we are now seeing something around the 40, 40 euros, 40 dollars. So I, I would expect uh, hopefully something like that. However, if we, the question is uh, what should be the, the right price of carbon, we are uh, sort of way, way below what uh, economists and natural scientists believe is the right price. So till a couple of years ago, the idea also on the basis of the uh, US Environmental Protection Agency estimates was that the appropriate uh, price for carbon would, should have been around $100 per tonne. However, there are more uh, sort of updated research and uh, simulations that show that actually the appropriate price for, uh, for carbon should be much, much higher. So, um, uh, for example, San Diego University has estimated that the range is probably in the order or 180 to uh, $600 per ton with the most likely uh, sort of most appropriate price being around $400 per ton. So, um, uh, so the question is, uh, what will Hong Kong, China do? Um, uh, probably, uh, my, my guess is that uh, they will start with a price that is more in line with Europe. But, you, uh, 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 you know, uh, if we really are serious about ta tackling this challenge, climate change, the, the real price of carbon should be way higher. Robert, do you have any thoughts on that? And uh, the question is not just the initial the price today, but how it progresses into the future. So um, the London School of Economics published a paper back in, I think it's 2018, called the Economics of 1.5 Degrees, which showed a sort of exponentially rising car carbon price being required, getting up to somewhere around 500 US a tonne by mid-century and 1,000 by the end of the century, as you gradually squeeze the last bit of toothpaste out of the carbon emissions tube. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and Catherine, I have a question for you. And uh, you, you gave us a very comprehensive presentation, but I would like you to tell our audience about the Green Fin label. And uh, so what is it? And, and so how is it used? Uh, and because I think that might be something we want to look at for Hong Kong as well. So, uh, yes, it's okay. Uh, <coughs> maybe one of the very interesting things on the French market was in 2015, the government, the French government decided to launch two labels for sustainable products, which is, uh, I guess, uh, I think it's the only one to do so. So there was a, na a label for broadly, for broad sustainable finance, which is called, that's the trick, SRI label and there was another one just for green products called Green Fin now <coughs> sorry which means and we are auditors of these Green Fin labels which has a taxonomy related to climate bonds initiative as Victoria mentioned first and others the idea was to apply what I explained at the beginning of this session that you need to have 
a percentage of green economy, uh, green activities in your portfolios first. Second, you need to check uh, if there is no significant harm and to um, exclude, and that's maybe the main point, to exclude all the fossil energy. It means coal, it means oil and gas, but also nuclear energy. So please keep in mind that this is the French government. So they, um, they decided to have a green fin label which means that nuclear is uh, not part of that. And last but not least, um, the, um, the funds uh, need to have a policy about how they comply to global compact or, um, or over, enfin, they have no controversial companies on E or S or G issues into the, the portfolios. Uh, that's very interesting because when the, the Greenfin was launched, uh, many actors said, okay, it's very good, it's very green, but there is no market because you have uh, very few pure players on the listed uh, markets. And we say that that time, five years ago, that this is a growing market. This is a niche, but this, is, this niche, this niche is growing, um, is will be, it's the, the future. So you can find more and more companies who are compliant with this criteria. And, that's work, and that worked, and that works too. Uh, you, can f you can find all the figures about Greenfin and green European products on our website, novetic.com. Um, on market data, we publish every quarter some figures about these markets, and you can see how Greenfin is growing. It's still a niche, but it's a very interesting one. Okay, thank you very much for that. I, I found this actually quite fascinating and maybe we could have some inspiration from that from for our people here that's, in Hong Kong. Maybe if, if I can add something, that's very important and that's why uh, Professor Gibson mentioned the eco-label, the European eco-label. Uh, these tools, and I was one of the very strong support for an eco-label because the idea is now Every investor said, I am, my product is sustainable. Uh, there is a lot of sustainable washing, green washing and others because uh, it's not, there is no norm, global norm about what is uh, really sustainable or what is not. So we need really to have some tools to check, to guarantee to the customers and especially when it's a, a saver, a personal savers, that uh, this is a real sustainable product or so a real uh, Greenfin. I just uh, forget to mention that we need to have also impact indicators because the next uh, big thing is how we measure the impact of the performance on financial aspects, but also on environmental and social aspects. That's a very strong point. And uh, in France, uh, a lot of uh, people are working on these issues in impact indicators. Well, that, that's great. And that allows me to bounce back to, uh, to Professor uh, Gianfranco Gianfrate uh, about the um, uh, greenwashing part. Uh, I know that uh, you've been a little bit uh, worried about this and maybe you want to share your views on uh, the role of standards and uh, the need for governance there. Yes. Um, so. Uh, I believe uh, greenwashing is uh, happening on a massive scale in uh, financial markets at, at company levels. So by greenwashing, we, we mean that uh, uh, companies or investors are uh, uh, doing much less than they are claiming uh, in terms of sustainability and in particular in terms of uh, climate footprint. So they do that by, for example, uh, uh, under-reporting their, uh, for example, the, the, the carbon footprint by uh, so, uh, sort of uh, uh, um, replacing numbers uh, and metrics with the narratives where they claim that they will in future somehow address sustainability. And so you can see that there are uh, uh, very large companies, sometimes very, very important names 
that publish these uh, amazing uh, sustainability reports with a lot of uh, uh, artistic pictures and a lot of uh, uh, positive and poetic narratives about how they are sustainable, how they care about the environment, how they care about uh, the people around their company. But then there is uh, no metric, so that there is no uh, tangible measurement of what they are doing. And this now has shifted from uh, uh, companies to investors and uh, to banks. So they claim they are integrating sustainability in uh, their investment decisions in the portfolio locations. Uh, but then, you know, I, I invite you, uh, for example, to have a look at uh, uh, many uh, investment funds, uh, for example, in the US or, or in Europe or in Asia, that have the, the word uh, sustainable or green in their name. So very often you can download the, uh, the, uh, the, the list of their holdings from their website and you would uh, easily see that uh, uh, the green funds uh, that they, they manage uh, uh, have a very large exposures to companies uh, of uh, oil companies or companies that, are, that run uh, coal energy plants. Um, and the idea is that they claim they are sustainable because they say, in the investment process, we consider sustainability. But, but that's a, as a completely empty claim because the result is that they, they have uh, as much fossil fuel uh, securities, uh, fossil fuel related securities than other non-sustainable uh, funds. So uh, this is uh, really a, a growing phenomenon uh, and uh, probably it's the new standard. Greenwashing is the new standard in a uh, business sector and in the investment community. Uh, just, just, just to, to give you a sort of a flavor, uh, the vast majority of financial companies and investment institutions have now signed the United Nations Principle for Responsible Investment. So uh, if you look at the numbers, basically 90 to 95 percent of the financial institutions in the world are integrating sustainability in uh, their uh, investment decision in their portfolio. Uh, but, but then uh, if you look at their holdings, at their behavior, when, for example, there are shareholders meetings, you see that, that really nothing uh, has changed. So this is a, a, a challenge. And uh, again, this is why we need uh, uh, better people, we need more students to, to work on this, and I'm sure that more opportunities are going to open up uh, probably in the forthcoming decades, not, not just uh, next year, for people who are really able to detect these kind of behaviors, and they are really able to translate uh, these, uh, the, these metrics in, uh, in, uh, in uh, actual behaviors. Thank you very much. Uh, I have already three more questions from students that I would really like us to address, starting with a very interesting question from uh, Bido Ceci Emmanuel. Uh, is any African country, university, company or bank already engaged in sustainable finance? Do you, any of my panelists have any ideas about that? Um. Yes, I can uh, maybe just, I know, there is, and I'm very uh, sad of that because I'm uh, French and Senegalese. Um, the point is we have just, uh, we have something in Nigeria and South Africa uh, because uh, they were uh, part of some uh, networks first. And uh, if you can check uh, with, uh, on the PRI website, <coughs> you will find some signatories by this, by some countries. Maybe one of the very interesting points is how work the stock exchanges, uh, because in some emerging countries, uh, stock exchanges are the first door to integrate ESG uh, criteria and to ask some ESG reporting from companies. And Johannesburg uh, Stock Exchange will do that. And some things began, but it's really um, it's a, a small movement at the time. And uh, as you mentioned, we need to uh, we need to address the issues that Gianfranco said that because uh, now we are in the time where every 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 actor is uh, claims to be sustainable, and that's why in every part of the world we need uh, to check how far they. Uh, are sustainable and we need to check 
um, with uh, what kind of, uh, with the data published. And just to give you an example, uh, for when we publish our data on the market, we don't integrate all uh, products which claim to be uh, sustainable. We really check which are uh, which are the pro uh, how they do that, which are the processes. And to come back to Africa, I can mention that there are some uh, a few uh, students from Africa, from uh, Dakar and other countries in the Master of Sustainable Finance uh, that uh, where I teach. Thank you so much, Anne-Catherine, for sharing that. And uh, bouncing on that question, there is an, another question from Bianca saying that uh, while ingress, green investing is less common in developing countries, they seem promising for this upcoming year compared to Europe's performance. Do you see this happening or not? I don't know who wants to take that question. Anybody? No. Mm. I don't think we have, uh, okay. Um. Maybe I found that's very important to to underline that we need a global movement. We need a global participation to all the aspects that we uh, mentioned today. And uh, the problem is that right now we have a strong uh, movement on renewables, which is not only on Europe, but it's really a worldwide movement. Uh, but maybe one and that's why i was very pleased to be with you this morning is we need to scale up the understanding about why uh, sustainability sustainable finance is the only way uh, to manage assets to manage companies right now and we need to really uh, make a big shift of the um, of the in the brain of the people who uh, drives countries, companies, or uh, investors, and that's maybe our issue. That's why um, we need to promote more. Um, everybody says now we build, we need to build back better, but uh, the the real point is how do we, we do that, uh, and how we assess differently companies' models, and how we uh, we change our economics. And that's maybe the point in every part of the world. Thanks, anne Catherine. And uh, I have another question here, which I think Robert and, and Jen Franco might, might be able to address, which has to do with differences uh, in taxonomies between different region. Uh, and if so, can we and how justify these differences in green definition? So maybe Robert, you want to start? Well, I'd start off by saying that the work that's being done uh, under the IP finance, sustainable investment, uh, fin sorry, sustainable finance uh, the, on the common ground taxonomy. So you have an international group co-chaired by China and by the EU that's looking at this and aiming to produce a agreed taxonomy in the middle of this year. So if they are successful in that, it will overcome much of this problem. Okay, Jan Franco, anything to add on this? Uh, no, I, 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 I completely agree with, with Robert. Uh, my cons I definitely see that there is going to be a sort of convergence of taxonomies across jurisdictions. My only concern is uh, uh, how enforceable these taxonomies are going to be, because the risk is to have a very detailed, very granular taxonomies, but that they are sort of left to voluntary basis for companies and investors. So that, 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 that's my concern. And my response to that would be, um, it's going to be the job of the Sustainability Standards Board set up by IFRS to uh, police that, that, uh, the, that they will produce standards which say you have to follow that taxonomy and you need to have your report audited. And if you're a fund manager uh, you've got IOSCO, so you've got uh, in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, that, well, more particularly the SFC, the Securities and Futures Commission, uh, which will be looking at uh, funds that people want to release and confirming 
that they do comply with the taxonomy. So once we get the taxonomy, things can happen. May I add something? Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, uh, maybe one of the biggest challenge is the difference uh, between companies and investors because something is very strange since five years that uh, finance takes the lead. And finance is not, uh, financial actors are not the good one to really make this shift in the industry in to promote green activities. It's really a question from companies. And we see in Europe a very big uh, gap um, with the idea that they have to move uh, to green models. And that's why that's, uh, Jen Franco and, and Robert are right. We are at risk that this all this doesn't work if the companies don't um, take taxonomy as a new tool to uh, um, to change their strategy. And now we see in Europe a strong, strong, strong lobbying against taxonomy, against SFDR, which is, and the, the baseline is we are not ready. And we have a COVID-19 crisis. And that's why it's very important now to face this lobbying and to try to really make them understand that they have no choice to do something else. And if they do business as usual and to say no regulation, uh, no obligation, times are too complicated, uh, we will not succeed to meet Paris Agreement. And uh, as uh, a big insurer said, a world at four degrees is no more insurable. It doesn't work anymore, all the financial systems. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we are almost running out of time. I just wanted to, to get my panelists' attention to the question in the Q&A from a uh, student, Eric Fun, who's asking for help on uh, research he's doing to track energy consumption, users' performance, KPI for energy trading. If you have any information, kindly email him. Um, we have run out of time. You've been fantastic. I've learned so much. And it's a wonderful example of cross-border cooperation, interdisciplinary cooperation. And I hope we're going to see many more such things. Thank you very much uh, to uh, my uh, first panel panelists. Uh, and then we are going to switch gear very quickly. Uh, thank you very much, Robert and Catherine Gianfranco. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.